Welcome to Eric Bowman's solo exhibition, More to the Picture. Uh, this is his largest exhibition to date, and we're really excited to, to have him here and uh, to host you all here. Uh, we're going to do a quick conversation, probably 20 to 30 minutes, and, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions if anyone has any. And uh, to kick it off, uh, our friend Joe has, uh, has graced us with his presence and is going to do a little introduction for us. So, Joe, it's all you. You guys hear us okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you good. hear me okay? Yes. Okay. In the back, Bill. Can you hear me all right? All right. Cool. Uh, so my name is Logan. Um, if you don't know me, I'm an artist. Um, and Bo, who was just speaking a minute ago, uh, we spoke a while, uh, several months ago, and in anticipation of the show, talked about the idea of me being here to do an interview with Eric and just kind of do like art talk. And I do this a lot with artists, you know, not generally not in front of people. So it might be a little bit inside. We'll try and make it understandable to someone that may not be an artist, but that's my interest is to like kind of get inside and, and ask artist questions, things that I'm interested in, maybe technical things inspirations, Logan history. is an amazing artist. If you don't know who Logan Ajiz is, he's an amazing artist in the Western world, a big star, really. Yeah, I'm a big star. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the plan. And I have zero, zero preparation. Um, I kind of thought of a couple things on the way down here. And I don't know what he's going to ask you. Yeah. So. So, but this is like, for, for me, it's easy, like just to be able to talk to a fellow artist, there's so many questions I have that we're not gonna be able to fit it into, what do we say, 20 minutes or so. So, um, so um, I guess the thing that I'm first curious about, I know we've talked a little bit about your, your earlier history as an illustrator. So um, I wanna talk about that, but also before that, your, what was your schooling like? like art school for me is always very interesting. There's so many different paths that, that we tend to take uh, to get to be in, into this life as a professional artist. So, so early schooling, meaning like art school, did you do any sort of art school? Well, that's a very short answer. I, I'm basically a high school graduate. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I had maybe two semesters of junior college. I never went to art school, no. 
Okay. And then, so what was your transition then from junior college? Did you take art classes at all in junior college? No. No. I was, I was probably like a lot of kids, you know, I think everybody, I, was Picasso or somebody said that every, every kid's an artist, but it gets kind of beat out of you or, you know, educated out of you at some point. But I was always drawing from the time I was a kid and all the other kids in class, like maybe from second grade on, always looked to me to be the artist, you know? Yeah. So um, I'm basically self-taught, um, school of hard knocks kind of thing. So then your transition from junior college to then into the world of illustration, how did that happen? It's, it's very serendipitous kind of thing. I went, uh, I had a friend whose father was kind of an entrepreneur who wanted to start a toy company and he got some investors and found out about me through his son and kind of brought me on board to sketch out his ideas. I think that was my first in full-time employment as an artist. Before that I did, I airbrushed surfboards for a couple of surfboard manufacturers um, in Southern California. And I worked at a t-shirt shop as a silkscreen t-shirt printer and designer. So I just showed my portfolio and got these jobs. It, it didn't, nobody asked for a degree or anything. They just looked at what I could do. And then, so one, one job led to another and I kind of learned as, as I go. And you sort of build your portfolio that way, each yeah. job that's like a new addition to your portfolio. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to be I wanted to be a comic book artist at one point. And I, I did some comic book work. And I moved north to Portland, Oregon. I grew up down in southern Orange County. I moved to or uh, Portland, Oregon area in the late or mid mid eighties. And I was showing my portfolio around and someone told me about it an illustration studio in town and they thought I would fit good there because my portfolio, I had comic book work, I had airbrush illustrations, I had t-shirt designs, I was kind of all over the map and they said, you look like an illustrator, you should go talk to Jim Smith who owns Art Farm, was the name of the place in Portland. They had all the best illustrators under one roof in a big uh, Victorian house huh. and I always thought Victorians were really cool, I used to draw those when I was a kid. And so I went and showed him my portfolio, and he, he could see some raw skills there. And he invited me to move in. And I, I think I paid a $10 a month token rental you know, payment. And I got a room in this big Victorian house with all these other illustrators wow. who knew what they were doing. And I would just walk around and look over their shoulders and ask them questions. And I got assignments based on you know the skill level I was at. But I learned a lot in the two and a half years I was there, and then I moved to another group studio across town. So I basically, you know, learned on the job. That's yeah, my so education. That's your art school, really. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of the best, I feel like, in a lot of ways. Like, art school, it's great for, like, sort of that basic training, but, like, especially right. in the illustration world, just, like, getting out there and figuring out how to do things. Yeah, like I, I ran, I've, I've known people that went through uh, Art Center, College of Design in Pasadena, where I wanted to go. Yeah. And uh, they didn't know half the stuff I knew about the business side of being a freelance artist. Yeah. And so I, I could talk to you about this, like that topic alone for an hour, but I'm going to stop myself. Um, did you, what led you into fine art from there? Is, did you tire of this so, sort it's of? It's so weird. You know, I could imagine this is, this applies to just about any vocation, but maybe more so with artists, because it's just such a fantasical, fantasical kind of world. I, uh, another artist, illustrator, moved up to my area, and he was getting a lot of work from Disney. He was an airbrush artist, and I was heavy into airbrush illustration at the time. And he heard about me, and he needed help, so he hired me to come help him. Well, it turns out that he went to high school with an artist named Tim Soliday, hmm. and he, he went down to California to visit his folks one Christmas. He took his video recorder with him. This is in the 90s. Yeah. And he went and visited his old friend, Tim Soliday, and took a film of Tim's, inside of Tim's studio, and brought it back. And he said, I want to show you what this guy, my old high school friend, is doing. 
And I had no idea what, what fine art was all about at all. I was just an illustrator. Everything I did was for commercial use, you know, it was to promote a product or a magazine article or something. And he showed me this video of Tim's work and I was blown away. And I said, wow, I'm really interested in this. So uh, the following Easter, I took my wife and we went down to visit my folks in Long Beach. And my friend set it up so I could come and visit Tim. And I hung out with Tim for the weekend. And he took me over to another artist named Steve Houston. And in just two days, those guys, they turned my world upside down. And I realized this is what I want to do. I don't want to be an illustrator anymore. I want to paint people, landscapes. I want to paint, you know, I want to make art for art's sake, not art to sell some other product. Yeah. And that's what started me. But it took about 12 years to make the transition where I could dismiss my agents in New York and quit illustration and become a full-time fine artist. Okay, so you sort of dabbled in it. Yeah, you know, I was sort of, living in both worlds yeah. for a long time. That's interesting. Yeah, I can imagine those two artists specifically being very inspiring. Yeah, but think know. about the odds of that. Like yeah. I would run into some guy, or word of mouth, I would meet this guy who just happened to be best, best friends with a fine artist in Southern California. Yeah. And I have folks living in Southern California still. So I come down and I meet him. And, you know, my career's been that way. I just, it's never been a straight road. It's always been these bizarre doors that open up and I go through and I meet somebody and something happens. And That's interesting, those two artists, so Tim Solday, if, if people don't know him or have never met him, he's just like this, he's just all energy. Like he's oh, just yeah. like this super inspiring. He's crazy. Energetic guy, yeah, he almost like, it's like he's like maddened by art. Like he's just like, it's, it's, it's he's like struck in by art. Yeah. And then Steve Houston is this like, larger than life, articulate, like just um, knowledge filled artist. With, so like that, that I mean, I can imagine that would, that would I have could, blown I me couldn't away. have picked two better guys. I didn't know them from Adam when I met him. Yeah. But I found out later on how influential they were, how you know amazing they were. And yeah, that's a lucky strike. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so skipping way forward, um, I want to talk a little bit because we don't have a whole lot of time. I want to talk about your studio practice these days. Um, so, I love artist studios, and I saw from the, the video that Bo uh, put together on you leading up to the show, you've got a really cool studio. Um, did you build that space, and can you yeah. maybe describe it a little bit? No, so um, when I got the bug to want to be a fine artist, I knew I had to get a studio that had like north light windows. Mm -hmm. I was working out of a, a just a regular office, you know, corporate office building. Low ceilings, no decent lighting. So we searched for three years, my wife and I, to find a property that would have either a detached garage or some kind of building on it that I could turn into a studio. Mm -hmm. The day that this place we bought 21 years ago now went on the market, our agent called us and said, you gotta get down there. I think we found what you're looking for. And it's a 2,000 square foot footprint, 20 feet high, all wood, um, Quonset hut style building. So it's, you know, you cut a cylinder down the middle, that's what it looks like. It's all roof on the outside. And the guy that originally built it was an antique car collector. So he had a dozen cars out there, that's how big it is. Mm. And when I saw it, I knew that this, was, this could be a dream studio. Yeah. And it was in our price range and we were the first, you know, to put the offer down. And so we got it. And Did you get your north light, or what's your light yeah, situation? Yeah, I, yeah. Well, the one, you know, there was no windows in it, but the back side was facing north. Okay. And I put in 15 foot high north light windows. Now the guy behind me has some big trees, so it's not not 100 percent ideal, but it still gives me natural light to work by. Yeah. So in in art, like Very the important. yeah, the like ideal light for for artists is north light because, um, so this is north light facing out this way. Um, throughout the day, the light stays very, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It basically remains the same. There's, not, there's yeah, no consistent. direct sunlight, it's consistent, yeah. 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 Um, so that, that's the idea, the light just comes in, it doesn't change a whole lot. It's kind of a cooler light versus the south light or right. east-west would be a little bit warmer and it would, it would change obviously as the sun's coming through the window, so. And that's all, that's what all of the old, what I call the dead guys, the, the artists I revere from 100 to 150 years ago, they all work by natural north light. 
So I, you know, I thought that's what I needed to have. Yeah. It hasn't made me a better painter, but it's, it fits the, <laughs> it fits the description. I guess, Same with me. I, I, I build a studio and I have this huge, I don't know, not huge, not as big as your windows, but maybe eight by eight feet or something, big window on the north side of the studio. And I, I rely mostly on my lights, my LED lights, because I work a lot at night or very early yeah, yeah, in the morning. Yeah, I have supplemental light too. Yeah, so it's kind of just for the tradition of it. Yeah. More than anything, I feel like. Um, okay, now into your actual, the, the way you work. I, I'm fascinated by your color studies that you do for your painting, like leading up to the paintings. I know you start um, with s sketches in a, in a sketchbook, like little doodles, yeah. and then you work them up into color studies, um, and then onto your final piece. Do, do you do that for every single piece that you do? Like every piece we see here, was there a color, uh, like a little uh, pencil sketch or something in a well, sketchbook? Well, absolutely a sketch. Uh, Not okay. necessarily a color study. For the bigger ones, yes. Uh -huh. It's a you know it's a scale thing. If it's something small, and I can visualize it really well, I don't necessarily do a color study. Okay. But um, if if there's any budding artists that are here, I want I want to throw this disclaimer out. Don't do what I did. Try and find a good art school to go to, and get some good solid you know foundational training because I've eventually gotten to where most of my contemporaries are maybe that did go to art school but I learned a lot of things the hard way later on that I wish I would have known earlier mm -hmm. um, but I, I think traditionally I do go through the same steps now from a, a thumbnail size you know little postage stamp doodle in my mind of an idea to a, a bigger sketch and then hiring models and then either working you know from live models or from photographs and then doing an acrylic, uh, small, comfortable size color study. And acrylics, because they just dry quicker, I can you know, have my hand halfway over the painting without smudging anything. And then go from that to the bigger canvases. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of what most people do. But I get what, the way I've described it before is, it, if I make a, what I think is a successful painting, I probably arrive there later than somebody else might because a lot of the time I just really don't know a better way to do it. I just do it the way I do it. And I'm, I'm sure if I'd gone to school and been in a community of other artists, I might have learned some shortcuts or some better ways to do it. But I'm in this ditch now of doing it the way I do it, and that's how I'm going to do it the rest of my time. Yeah. You know, yeah. It works eventually. When it does work, it, it comes out. I think we all have our own weird quirks and weird ways of working, you know? Yeah, um, That's all part of it. And I, I feel like, you know, one question I have for you, I, I find when I do a color study for a piece, which I don't always, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, I have a hard time, um, I guess, like matching the energy that I can get into oh, this yeah. little piece yeah, yeah. and making it happen. Like I get bored with a large piece because it doesn't have that energy. Do you, do you struggle with that at all? Absolutely. I, I've learned over time that um, there's a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Like we're, as human beings, we're five to six feet on average height. Our eyes are only so far apart and our arm is only so long. And there's a, there's a window there, a space that's comfortable to work in, a ratio that works with our vision. And once you go beyond that, like that huge painting you did that was at the 10 year, that was leaning against the wall, was so big like a garage door size painting that Logan did. Um, some things that are small, they don't transfer. I'm not, I just talking about, I'm referring to yours as yeah. just a big scale painting. It, it worked very well, it, looked, it was a beautiful piece. But sometimes something that's small that you do a study for or a sketch in your sketchbook, it's hard and sometimes it doesn't transpose to something, you know, many times larger. Mm -hmm. And I learned that a lot of uh, a lot of muralists began using a, a, a holding line, a, a, a solid, either a dark or a thick outline around the major shapes in a painting, to hold it together at a larger uh, scale. Just because that's how we view things. Hmm. Or and it's the same principle. If you go down, way down small, as an illustrator, I had a. I still have a, a demagnifying glass. 
So it looks like a magnifying glass, but it makes everything small. Mm -hmm. Because you wanted to know what you were working on, how it was going to look when it was printed in a magazine, much to, you know, several times smaller. And whether it goes up really big or down really small, there's some there's information that gets lost going down small, and there's some information that gets it doesn't read the same when it gets really big, like up on a billboard size. Yeah. And so I have no interest in doing anything the size you did. Mm -hmm. It's just I don't want to do that. Your stuff is more graphic, so it kind of holds together better. Mm. My stuff, I wouldn't be able to do, you know, like a eight by ten foot painting. It would be really difficult for me to do. So scale is something I always keep in mind. Uh huh. Yeah, actually, Steve Houston once mentioned to me early on. I, I studied with Steve Houston. Oh, did you? Yeah. Um, and he mentioned that something about the idea of sometimes you can get away with like a really cool brush stroke or something yeah. or gesture on a little painting. Right. And to be able to do that 10 feet wide, no. that, that brush doesn't act You're, the same. The brush doesn't, it's not as big. It doesn't yeah. hold as much paint. It won't pull as long a stroke. Your arm can't go all the way across the canvas. Yeah. So there's some effects that are impossible to get once you get beyond that scale. Yeah. You know, you have to figure out a different way to do it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which I think in some ways my, my, the way I work maybe makes more sense for that because yeah, your stuff you know, could be scaled up huge. It, yeah, more, it could go little or large, yeah. you know, small or large. Um, I don't know. Where, where are we at, Bo? Should we keep going? Should we you guys maybe bored ask yet? some questions? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't have questions, but I could ask a question. Um, so, do you want to talk a little bit about your like your inspiration of the the West? Like, I feel like. I've known about your work for years, even before you started doing, um, I know you did some Western subject matter earlier on, but I feel like since you've sort of taken this on more, you've exploded, yeah. meaning like your inspiration, I can tell, I see the excitement in your work. Um, can you kind of tell me about, uh, about that? Yeah, I was, I was very intimidated by Western art several years ago because I was looking at all of the cowboy artists of America and the earlier guys that were doing Western art. Mm -hmm. And most of their work was about, you know, it was very historically accurate, number one, which I had no interest in being historically accurate. I don't, history's fine, but I don't want to do all that research. Yeah. And they were very detailed, I mean, painting every little hair, every, you know, all these little tiny brushes. And I had, I had had enough of that. I'd done enough of that as an illustrator, painting a lot of detail. I wanted to do something more stylized, and I saw your work, and I don't know if you were the first guy to do it, but you were probably the first guy to get a lot of exposure to do the Western genre in a very stylized, unique approach. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, definitely wasn't the first, but yeah. Yeah, but you got you were one of the first that like made a big name for yourself that I recognized anyway, and I thought. That's interesting. This guy's doing, he's getting attention and he's doing something completely different in the Western genre. And then, um, so I thought, you know, I would try something just, just for the fun of it. I did a little, I think it was only like a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12 portrait of a cowboy, an old grizzled cowboy smoking a cigarette. And my aunt bought it to be su supportive. Yeah. And so, but I put it online. I put it on. YouTube or, or I mean uh, Facebook or Instagram and uh, and Bo saw it, your brother, and he called me and he said he asked if I had anything else like that because you guys were coming up on your uh, small work show where you invite outside artists that aren't represented by the gallery full time, and so I was thrilled when he called me about that, but it was already sold. And I had to tell him I, I already sold that, and he said, "Well, do you have anything else?" And I said. Yeah, sure, <laughs> and I didn't. And so I scrambled and I came up with another painting. And then I, um, it's a great story because my, my good friend Phil Olson here of, of Mayan Olson Framers, one of the top framers in the country. Um, I didn't know him yet, but I thought, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be in Maxwell Alexander, this up and coming big deal gallery. This is like 2016. And uh, I thought, well, I better step up my frames because I was putting my stuff in cheap, crappy frames at the time. Yeah. So I thought I'd, I'd seen Phil's work before, and so I sent the painting down to Phil to get framed. Phil calls me up and he says, I love this painting, I want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, so now I'm in this dilemma. It's like, well, but I got, I'm going to be in this show. So I thought, let me think about this. Uh, I know. I'll sell it to Phil if Phil will agree to let me hang it in the show. And I'll give the commission to Bo. Yeah. And I thought that'd be a good move. And so Bo was fine with that. And then he said, well, since that one's sold, do you want to put another painting in the show? And I said, sure. <laughs> and again, I had to scramble and I came up with another piece and that sold in the show. And then he asked for more work. And eventually, I think it was like my fourth or fifth painting I sent to him. And then I called him up one day and I said, so am I in the gallery now? And Bo said, oh yeah, yeah, you're in the gallery. We just haven't put you on the, web on the website yet or uh. anything. And so, <laughs> that's how I got in here. It's just another funky way a door opens up when I get this opportunity. And now I'm in one of the greatest Western art galleries in the country. True story. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's so amazing. Like, there's no, in all the artists that I speak with, there's no direct path to how this happens. No, there's no roadmap weird... for this at all. Yeah. yeah, it's just, you do it if you have a passion to do it. And I believe that I tell younger artists this, if you have a passion, to create art and you're really serious about it, you know, you put everything you got into it, the doors will open. Whether you believe in God, that's who I give the credit to, or the universe or whatever you, you know, karma, however you want to describe it, things will happen and you'll, you'll find a place and you'll, you'll fall into that place. And, you know, I've been blessed since I've been in this gallery for sure. It's awesome. I think that's a great place to wrap things up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.